This is Don't Get Me Started. This is a conversation about advertising. And here is your host, freelance creative director and creative circuits department head, Dan Balser. Yes, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Um, Gavin Lester's in Los Angeles. I'm in Atlanta. And um, we're still in a pandemic. And I don't honestly don't even remember the last time I recorded one of these conversations. This, this change of life has... I don't know. I feel like I'm like, we're like evolving into some other type of human being or something at this point. Like we're becoming something new. We're all trying to figure out how to live in this situation. And um, Gavin and I have only recently met. Um, I had the pleasure of listening to his presentation on Google meet, like we've been doing Mm -hmm. our forums, um, sharing some wisdom. And um, before we get into this, just so you know, if you on the other end of this did not do your homework and look up Gavin Lester, holy crap, this guy is the, the real deal. Um, he's won multiple dozens of awards. I can't even, the list of awards, I, I wasn't going to use my printer paper to print out all the awards. It's unbelievable. Um, voted most awarded art director in the world in the past. He's had that des- designation. Best UK ad of the year for Levi's Odyssey campaign. Voted campaign's best cinema commercials for Sony Ericsson. Um, work could be found in MoMA and in the Victorian and Albert Museum. Um, As you know from the name of the show, Gavin is now partner and CCO at Zambezi out in L.A. He um, has worked – I'm just going to run through a couple of the places he's been – Euro RSCG. He was at Bartle Bogle Hegarty, also known as BBH, for six years in London. I'm going to go on a limb and and assume that that's kind of where uh, Gavin's DNA was formed as as a creative. Um, Spent two years at Goodby Silverstein and Partners in San Francisco before going to L.A. at Saatchi and Saatchi Team 1. He spent some time at 180 LA, Deutsch, 72 and Sunny, and I think has hit his stride as a chief creative officer now at Zambezi. Um, Zambezi, if you don't know it, on the other end of this, um, is an independent agency. And I want to ask, we're going to get into this in a second. I really want to know from Gavin's perspective what that means to be an independent agency. They're also the most awarded and largest female-run agency in the United States. Um, And right now, I think, Correct me if I'm wrong, Gavin. I think that the primary accounts are um, – well, you have to tell me what they are because the work that I was looking at here is the work that you've done, worked on Google, HTC, Beats by Dre, and Levi's. But you're going to have to tell us yeah. what, what you're working on. Yeah. And, and welcome to the microphone. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. I'll try and answer those questions. We have TaylorMade Golf Clubs. We have the USJ, which is the, the, the golf organization that kind of uh, you know the, is, is um, in charge of the, the Open. At Wingfoot, we have um, oh my word, we have Traeger Grills, uh, an amazing wood pellet grill um, that's actually been just blowing up mainly, you know, because it's a great product and because of COVID, people have been eating in and staying at home. Eating in, we have yeah, we have um, UKG, which is a, a very large um, uh, HR solutions company. Uh, so it's B two B, but I think B two B sometimes gets a stigma for being not that great but actually it is a great opportunity to do good work they are um a very very interesting company that want to do good in the world and put people first um, what is that one of the best, it's called well they just merged it was originally ultimate software and, and chronos was the other company and they merged to become the ukg group okay um but well, you know, I, I worked the, on business to business for three years in the middle of my yeah. career uh, the most rewarding work i've ever done it's interesting, isn't it? Because you think about some of the companies like General Electric, what BBDO did with General Electric, or do with General Electric. That's a B2B piece of business. So never underestimate, you know, the opportunity, even though it may not be direct to consumer. Do you know what um, I love about you know what I love about yeah. B2B? I love that the, the products you're advertising yeah. exist to solve real problems. They're not gum or pants no. or hats. That they exist to solve a specific problem and yeah. There's so much to leverage in creative when there's a real problem being solved. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. I mean, <clears throat> I know we're going to move around a bit, but like the, the, the opportunities in this industry to work on things like that, but also work on things even a year before it's actually in front of consumers is interesting. You know, we have the opportunity to be right in the zeitgeist of change. We have, you know, when, every, when people say, what's in your crystal ball? Well, we just have to look what's in the brief because I could, tell you quite a lot of times you know what's going to be happening i remember launching the hybrids you know i launched the hybrid vehicles and that was a you know 
fundamental kind of moment in automotive history. If you think about what happened, it was really kind of the testing ground for all, all the stuff that's going fully electric, you know, and all the conversations around, you know, uh, carbon footprints were happening back then. This was, this was like 2007, right? Team one. So that was a team one. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so, you know, again, it's about, that's just multiple things. Tech, anything technology based I've worked on as well. Like you're getting glimpses into kind of what's coming, you know, before anybody else so there's quite a bit of responsibility that you have there because you've got to keep your mouth shut but the other thing is obviously making sure that the kind of you know the future is is you're going to present the future in a way that is optimistic yeah that's, that's pretty cool yeah. well speaking speaking of the job and the responsibility as you're going through your your client list i see i see you mm. looking up looking around and before we started recording, you had said that you like to keep your life separate. You like to keep your, your, your you're at the office today. It looks like it's pretty quiet behind you, one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I want to, I'm just curious about this. I ask this question often to people who have had uh, rapid rises or like shifts in their roles in advertising. And talk mm -hmm. to me about what your job is now versus what it was when you were an art director. And I know that you do fine art on the side, but how do you approach mm -hmm. who you answer to and what problems you're solving and how you approach your day? How does it feel? emotionally or psychologically to you different than it had earlier in your career? Well, I would say, you know, when, when you start on this business, every mark you make, every kind of good concept you come up with, is like a, a genius moment. It's a eureka moment. I'm going to, I'm going to win an award. I'm going to become a CD tomorrow, but it's really just that kind of, you know, the, the ignorance is bliss mentality, you know, because it's actually the first time you've actually experienced doing an idea like that. And 23, 24 years on, it's like I have, I have experienced millions of ideas and I've experienced those millions of those ideas millions of times over and over again, right? So the, the kind of the encyclopedic knowledge of, of concepts is a, is a really good thing, right? Um, but it's also a very kind of, um, it can hold you back because we're all seeking to be curious and kind of find new things. So... Whereas where it was at the very beginning was this kind of like green, kind of hungry, excitable, um, creative. I'm now, I'm still, I think I've still, I'd like to think I've still all those things, but I'm a little bit more wise in terms of um, curating the right ideas from the teams to put in front of the clients. Now that is not being pragmatic. That is about being really kind of like, you know, using my best wisdom and understanding the tone of the voice that the client is looking to have as opposed to the tone of voice into a creative. We always run into the problems of creatives want to put themselves first and hear their voice through through the work. But really it's the voice, you put in the voice of the consumer, the voice of the client or the piece of business that they're representing first. So that's kind of my, my role as a CCO is really making sure that, um, you know, uh, I, I have some objectivity so I can tap things either side to keep them on the rails. And then also it puts some really create kind of like a, almost like an injection of creativity where it's needed as well. So it's a great opportunity. It's a great job to have when it works, right? Because you're seeing all these amazingly talented, talented creatives and, and young managers kind of like bring something to, to, to fruition and then they present it to you and it's kind of, a lot of the kind of the hard work's done, but sometimes you just tap it, you know, prune it. So, so I don't know if that completely answers your question, but there is a difference. There is like more of a objectivity. I, 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 I pushed out. I mean, sorry, I'm a, I'm a more objective uh, viewpoint, um, and I have to kind of be a, you know, have to stop myself from rolling my sleeves up as well, and micromanaging because that's also damaging. Because you want to create an agency that is that hard for you. Not so much, no. I think, I think again, younger, as when I first became in management, I was, I was horrible. I was like, you know, it was like my ideas, you know, were king. Um, but, but now I'm just, what I'm, I've learned is like, I'm actually excited by new ideas and I'm excited by, I would never have thought of that, you know? That's, I love that's seeing that. That's maturity. Yeah. That's maturity. <laughs> so, so the one part you didn't answer is who you answer to. Yeah. I answer to, oh, the agency? Uh, well, I would say pra pra practically and philosophically. Oh, philosophically. Well, I think okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, being a part of the company, I, I think the, the principal and CEO Gene Freeman is, you know, my my direct report. 
but you know it's very much on a partner so and then on an elt so we, we kind of try and i'd like to think we're very very flat you know and it's not very um um you know i mean they, ultimately someone has to make the final decision and that's the role of a ceo and that's how it is and i you know i have to respect that but i do respect gina to, as a manager and philosophically who do i answer to I think I answered to, I would like to think I answered to kind of all of the kind of the, the hard work and creativity that has maybe been personified to, into this business over the years. And I answered to that, you know, it's like all that has been learned and shared and, you know, the feeling of leaving, leave it better than you found it, you know? So I don't think as an individual, I mean, there's been incredible individuals in my, my, my growth that have kind of definitely got, shone a lot brighter light than others, but, you know, but on the whole, it's this, the manifestation of this business, really, I, I think we answer to. Oh, that's so cool. Um, listeners, I apologize if there's weird audio things happening. I know that part of that got yeah. swallowed up, but it's pretty clear what you said. So yeah. one thing one thing yeah. you said earlier I think is so cool is that as a CCO, you 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 kind of hold the voice of the brand in your mind. That The filter you look at the work through is the, the – and you had such a cool slide when you presented to Creative Circus with uh, who would you rather – you remember the slide. It was who would you rather oh, be yeah. dead? Daniel Day Lewis or The Rock, and yeah. I love that analogy. You, you want to just—I don't want to spill it. I'm gonna let you tell that part. Yeah, move on. I, I use that, I use that a lot, and I use that a lot, you know, in with young creatives. You know, it's trying to wean them off the idea of like, you know, their voice isn't necessarily the voice that wants to be heard. And our job as creatives, I strongly believe that, is that we're we're more like actors, right? And there is a difference between The Rock and Daniel Day Lewis, and Who's to say that the rock can't be famous? He can, but it's very single dimension. There's one dimension to, to the rock. Everything will be the rock. Whatever he's in, he's such an opposing character, you know, he's going to feel like the rock, right? But Daniel Day Lewis would take on the character or the role of like Lincoln or, 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 or quadriplegic or the, who can paint with his foot or, or a, um, you know, or a tailor or, you know, or a go, or, sorry, a um, oil um, prospector. He would completely disappear from them. The yeah, Daniel Day Lewis would not be there. He would not be present anymore. And the brilliance is that he would really kind of like put all his energy in understanding that role and that character and then putting out the most incredible performance. And, and I think that's really what we do. I think that's really what we try to do, you know, in this business is, is like, is that, you know, that we, we really kind of absorb the, 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 the consumer. We really absorb what the, kind of the single-minded proposition is and we really kind of put these things out in a world which is um if through through the eyes of somebody else but there is always going to be a hint of us right and it's like if you think about what makes a two two great pianists right who have studied you know for the same amount of years and have reached the same grade level what makes them different is idiosyncrasy right so we are i think i would say that there is still something of us in there but it's not like it's not like the focal point you know? it's what it's happens between like... it's what happens between the notes that's right yeah and i said that's, challenge i meant channels he channels those, channels. those rules yeah yeah he, yeah he totally channels and i anyway so it's a huge i mean i i i, I love that i love that you know because i don't i'm not a big attention seeker you know um and you know like people say well, why do you put your your name on the end of these ads well we don't do that this business because it's not <laughs> we're not representing ourselves all right, so I, I want to move on to some more stuff that you yeah. talked about to the students. I want to ask you some questions sure. about yourself and your job. So um, there's this perception students have that you said of, of sort of the CCO as a grizzly bear, kind of unapproachable, and that you approach your role as more of a teddy bear because it's lonely at the top and you want interaction with juniors. So do you interact with new hires? Do you interact with the lower level people? And what is that relationship like? And what do you want it to be like ultimately in a working environment between a, someone who started an agency and the, and the CCO? Well, I try to hire people who uh, are respectful anyway. So if once you got through that, then there's going to be deference. But what I do talk about is that, you know, when I interview is that there's not much difference between you and I. We're both creative spirits, right? The only difference that I have over you is maybe just a bit more experience, but it doesn't mean that you're not. So I talk to people as creatives. I don't talk to people as, as you know, boss and, and, uh, and uh, employee. I talk to them as, as creative people. And I think what that does is it kind of puts them at an ease that they can kind of feel that, you know, we know that creatives, as a creative person, we need, we're looking for autonomy. We're looking for space. We're looking for that kind of ability to kind of um, make our mark, right? 
and if you give that the people that 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 platform i think they're going to do so much better there so i try to i try to i hope i mean i can't always change how people are you know but i want to make it very clear to people that i'm i'm up for for any conversation you know any conversation any time it's about creativity I also extend this invitation, by the way. I, I, everybody who gets hired at Zambezi, I spend half an hour with and I have a one-on-one -on -one with. And that's for, that's for a similar but different reason. It's because I think if you can re remove the kind of the, the, kind of the uh, formality, you know, yes, yes. Of, of, uh, you have, and you can put people at ease, I think all of a sudden they get more comfortable and they can do their best. And, I'm, I'm, and there's a lot of different people processes that people apply there's a lot of people like you know why didn't talk a lot about chaos it amazingly works for them right uh, but i kind of sometimes talk about um you know i like to be like a lincoln town car driving from the airport to my home right and what i like about that is it, it moves slowly enough or, but and it's and it's smooth and i can look around through all of the windows and take everything in and make a judgment right and i kind of like to have that tempo um, yes, I can work fast at times. Yes, I can work in chaotic situations. But I do think when you really have a creative tempo that is, that is, um, you know, where you can take everything in, it's it's um, it's very effective. Now that process works for me. Doesn't work for everyone, but I, I like that. The thirty minutes is so key because left without that, they draw their own pictures of you. Um, That's right. They, they, <laughs> They they figure out your 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 uh, your physical mannerisms are misread. Your um, yeah. your right. your sense of humor is is misunderstood. Uh, right. Your your off your kind of maybe a comment that you make is misread because uh, they don't know you. And I think that's awesome. I think there's also something yeah. you said that was buried at the beginning of that that I thought was really fascinating, which is this concept of ownership of giving giving a giving a creative that the right the, the sort of the ownership of the problem, the ownership of the project. Um, and you're saying, you know, giving them the sort of autonomy is the word you used. So early in your career, did, is this something that you were either denied that autonomy or, did, or were you given it and you wanted to replicate it? Can we, can, can you remember moments like that? Uh, you know what, I'll tell you what happened. So, you know, I, my partner and I, um, we started out uh, an agency called R R O. sorry, Euro RSCG. When I couldn't say I couldn't say it either yeah. earlier. I don't when, know why. W w yeah, we used to call it Euro Arse Cheese, and it was like an okay <laughs> agency. It was just it had lots of car automotive, and you know it had it had uh, some interesting spicy characters at the top. But you know we went in there, and and you know the culture of the place wasn't so much that the work was ever going to be pushed to be great, and that's okay. You know it's not bad to learn at a place. So we decided to make our own spec commercials. Right. And I remember kind of like going out and sit, sitting down with a few directors, <laughs> just like trying to get them to kind of put some money behind spec commercials. And, and we made quite a few of them. Really? And then we managed to get a couple on air. And then we got on in the one show, we got one show pencil and a DNA pencil. And that was basically our, our, our way out of your RSCG and that's to, to BBH. So, you know, to, I had to answer your question, which I completely forgot what the answer was. The question, the question. <laughs> Wait a yeah. second. That's that's yeah. crazy. So you guys yeah. had ideas and you found directors that wanted stuff for their reel. And yeah, guys, yeah. That's so badass. Yeah. So we were just like, like I remember, you know, I, I, some of the things I would have to do is like, you know, we we got it, managed to get it on air, but it was on there at a different time. So we clocked it. We we back at the time the quarter inch tape. You know, we would clock count clock clocks on the front of the commercials so we could get them into award shows <laughs> we did everything we kind of did all the terrible things you shouldn't have done but but you know it was it, we were scrappy you know but, that's the thing you created your own autonomy your own ownership yeah and i think that's exactly what you have to do now with all that i've said about giving people autonomy in the space they've also got to come to it with you know, the proactivity, the entrepreneurial kind of point of view and the fact that they are working at an agency that, you know, wants that from them. I always say to people, this is no different from any other agency. It's, it's cause the only difference is, is if you've got great ideas, no one's going to stop you, right? Mm. We're not going to stop you. And, and you're, if you want to do great work, that's on you. That's up to you. No one's going to do it for you, right? Yeah. Is that have to do with the fact that it's an independent agency? Is that a, a function of it's being an independent agency? Or, or how does the fact that it's independent affect a day in the life of a creative at Zambezi? 
Um, I, I think independence is one step closer to autonomy, right? Isn't it? Because you, you're you're less you know inclined to kind of um, be be pragmatic with the work and more inclined to take risks and push things. We have a saying here: is, you know, take take bigger bites. And I think that's the stuff when we do that is when we're really successful for not just ourselves but for our clients. So I think yes, I think independence is is a is a is a a really great thing i mean it, it goes back to like you know what do we really want we want no one to get into our shit right. Keep, you know and and the more we remove of, of kind of you know fingers and pies we have more chance to keep things pure and, and an idea and a concept you know you know you know this is that is that one little thing off it it's broken you know it's right. not it's not it's not like a um ideas ideas are indestructible if they're following the same path they should but one thing can stop it being successful. So, you know, our job is really custodials of kind of keeping the idea alive. So autonomy, independence does that because you can you feel that it's broke. Now, <clears throat> independent agencies still answer to their clients in terms of, you know, who's writing the checks at the end of the day. Quite but true. we also can we also can tell our clients that we don't think it's a good fit for this culture, you know. We've done that before with clients. So um, where other companies have to meet their kind of their, uh, uh, you know, their, their, um, their, numbers. their numbers. Yeah. yeah. You know? All right. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, yeah. the, the, the state, the nature of the business today. Um, what does collaboration look like ideally at Zambezi? Who's, uh, who's important to get along with besides your partner and how do partnerships work and how does it, are, you, are, are creative teams working with, um, with planners, are they working with uh, digital strategists, and h how does that work? And then talk just about the relationships that are important to build as you're making your way through the career. Yeah, uh, okay. So cross comms, cross plans is something we do at Zambezi, where that's communication is now you know strategy and communication, media communication and media buying, mm -hmm. and also we have kind of production and, and and you know creative, but all those things work together. You know, so I've worked really closely with strategy. Um, our chief strategy officer <clears throat> and I also work really close to the media because there's creative ways that media can kind of represent your ideas and then obviously when it gets to kind of creation we're working very closely with our production so it's really important that you have those kind of collaborations and, and I always say like you know my, my relationship with with uh, strategy is like it's like Dr. Spock and Captain Kirk right Captain like Dr. Spock you know Dr. Spock Dr. Spock will give you kind of an impartial point of view about the, the potentials um, kind of the, the chances of surviving a Klingon attack. It's 2,350 billion to one, you know, Captain. And Captain Kirk, the creative guy, would say, well, he would use his kind of intuition and his heart and his emotion to say, well, fuck that, let's try it. Yeah. I'll take that risk. So so that relationship is really vital. You know? It's Captain Kirk, Dr. Spock. It's like Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. You know? So mm. it's all these kind of these these partnerships that really, and actually the the... The, I, I, you know, the, 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 these partnerships that are really kind of fundamental to the success. And I think those partnerships, those collaborations are bigger than just those two people. Oh, it's a sure. whole, so I always encourage, uh, you know, anyone in the creative department, you've got to create your own little agency within this agency. If you're in a group and you're working on an account, you've got to look to your strategist, your media person, your producer, your account person, you know, about uh, as your own agency and work like that and mm. make it happen. So, Collaboration is vital um, and collaboration, but without, again, I'm going to say the word because I always found it very difficult to talk about collaboration earlier because people would kind of misunderstood it as or misconstrued it as, as pragmatism. This isn't pragmatic, right? This isn't, this isn't about making everybody happy because there's so many different voices involved. This is about protecting the idea and amplifying the execution or amplifying the creativity, right? So it's very important that I, I make that distinction because we are not a, a wishy-washy agency. We're not trying to just please, just for the sake of pleasing. We are trying to answer. We are trying to um, kind of push things forward. We're trying to kind of make a difference. So, and that's, you know, we're dreamers, you know, and it doesn't always happen, but that's, the, that's how we, have, we approach everything. I don't think of it as pragmatic or practical. I think of it as plus wanting and plus wanting and plus wanting. I, mean, yeah, I hope, well, I hope yeah. that's how people look at it. I don't know. Maybe people well, do. Maybe yeah. people do think it's about like, oh, you got to work as a team, work things out. No, we got to yeah. work, work together to kick, kick ass. Yeah. Um, 
So I wrote down some of the things you said. I put them in quote marks so they're verbatim. So you said, if it's the same, just make it better. So you're talking about craft, right? You're talking about um, going back once you have an idea and making it yours and ownable. How do you – Yeah. is that, is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah, so like, for instance, how many times has, has Romeo and Juliet, that love story, turned up over the years, right? We've seen it in West Side Story. It's been kind of like, you know, it's a – it's a kind of like a, almost mythological, right? The way that that story is positioned in, into into our world, right? So, West Side Story is a perfect example, actually. I mean, it's an old film, but but that is a that was contemporary, but back in the day. For let's take gangs, you know, the Jets and the Sharks, right? And let's reinvent that story into something contemporary. So, never be afraid of what I mean by it. So, what I really mean is that never be afraid by those familiarity in something. You know, what you do, you just kind of have to turn it you know i sometimes use the word draw it with your left hand right if your right hand oh. do it with your left hand you know and something um, remarkable comes from that so you know we, again like the the ego of the creative is sometimes you know it's its worst enemy and enemy you know, your ego ain't your amigo so let's just let's just think about like we don't own these things we just you know we just kind of put a spin on it that's cool because I tell students, I, I teach a very early quarter class called Introduction to Teams. It's the first time that mm. art directors and copywriters are working together to solve problems. And I tell them, I said, you're going to sit down, you're going to have a bunch of first thoughts. And you're going to probably want to throw them away because they're very familiar. Everyone would have thought of them. But, but maybe, maybe the way you read, maybe the way you take that thing and make it yours, maybe the way you craft it, maybe the way you, you decode it and rebuild it is, is, is really cool. Because the reason why Romeo and Juliet is such a popular theme is because it, it, there's something resonant and true about it, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. the reason why ideas are familiar is because they're, they're, I don't know, it's almost like a Beatles melody that, or a melody you hear that you feel like you've heard already the first time you hear it. It's a, there's a reason it's good. There's a reason it's, it's, it's always a story, and you can always build on it. Uh, another quote you said, it, um, seek out originality even though nothing is. Um, and this is basically what you're talking about, create a tone of voice. Um, and own it. And I, the reason why I'm, I'm, I wanted to talk about this is that I, I feel, and I'm going to share this with you, that because I work with people when they're learning the craft. And I think one of the things that people get confused about is when they have an idea, that's it. There it is. But I think that once you have that idea, that's when sort of job 2.0, which is probably more important than job 1.0, comes into play where you're putting your Daniel Day-Lewis take on it or your own original voice to it. And um, I don't know. Do you? Can yeah, you I, I can. I can. I, I think I, I can answer this. What? So. So here, here's a, here's an example. Right? I remember working as creative director, running a Netflix um, uh, account, and we had this idea for um, a Christmas a Christmas themed. They wanted a Christmas holiday themed execution. And I was talking to the team. It's like. Let's just, what happens if you tell the story from different vantage points or a different vantage point, right? Rather than from the vantage point of the little boy or rather than the vantage point of the dad or the family, wouldn't it be interesting to take this very familiar story about a dysfunctional family over the holidays and, and see it from a different point of view? And what we did, we told it from the vantage point of the, the fairy on top of the tree, right? So here is a traditional story that could have been, you know, taken from that point of view of the kid right which we've seen a million times but we now have this inanimate object that's been brought to life through Lorraine, Lorraine Bracco's voice who was you know in Goodfellas and it mm. just became really special and different all of a sudden so seeking out original originality um is is I would say you know even though the the story isn't original there's a vantage point that will give it a freshness you know? And then what that is, you know. what you did is you stood back, you stood away from it for a second and looked yeah. at it differently. And I think that's something that comes from practice as well. Um, mm -hmm. Another quote, and I have a question at the end of this quote. Another thing you said was eat creativity up and become stronger than you can ever imagine. So wh where do you go to gorge on creativity? Do you have time to consume stuff to fill the well with inspiration? Like wh what do you do personally do to to stay yeah. stimulated stay stimulated um well you know i mean it, that's kind of an obvious thing i said i would say but maybe it's needed and necessary for students but it's like you know people would say be a sponge and absorb everything 
I was very fortunate that I, I was trained as a sculptor. I tried to, uh, you know, my degree was in fine art. And learning about ways of looking, you know, and looking at things with, and trying to kind of extract meaning from them may, is a way of seeing, right? So it's, it, it's kind of that. It's like you could be obviously walking or you could be, you know, looking at a show or you could be reading a book or going to an art gallery or whatever, listen to some music. But it's what you, it's how you, you, what lenses you put over as you kind of trans, translate that work is, is important. So I, I'm very fortunate I have that. So I can see mythology in things, you know, and I can see, you know, uh, kind of other meaning in things. So I can, I can make, you know, maybe something that's happening in my personal life react with what I'm seeing and then there's further meaning coming out of it. Um, so, it so hold on, so hold on, hold on. Yeah. That's, that's, be, that's being observant. Yeah. That's being mindful and present, right? That's being willing to to see it. I've always I've often thought about the fact that we're similar in ways in advertising to stand up comedians who tell stories about things that we all know but don't notice. Yeah. Or we notice but, and don't talk about because we ignore it and because it's it's a, it's part of the pattern and it's about seeing things within the pattern that you're talking about. I think it's about seeing. You said you see mythology. You see mythology in a tree. <laughs> it's yeah. because you're paying attention. Yeah, but it's a way. It's a way of looking, you know. It's a. I mean, you know, like and I, the other thing that I, I I talk a lot about is is other things. Do other things outside of you know. There are some limitations with our business in terms of if you could look at them like limitations. When I talk about being Daniel Day Lewis and taking on other characters, you are to a certain degree suppressing your voice, right? Because you're adopting another one. But your voice still needs to come out in some places. You know, people play music, I make fine art, or people write. Or, and I think that's very important that you kind of still have your voice because there's one thing that you will learn more than anything about yourself is when you put something, that, you put a mark on a piece of paper or you strum a guitar, you, you, you will get to know yourself better than anything. So I think that's really important. Be self-aware, you know? And once you, you know, and the thing is, is that once, once you really, are, and I've learned this as well, like over the years, it's like, the more I, the more marks I make, the more things I do, the more I understand myself, and I, and then I, more I, I want to kind of understand other people, because I think I, w I don't want to say I've plateaued. I would think that would be a sellout, but I kind of got a very clear understanding of who I am, and it's nice to look at some of the things I've made as fine art pieces, for instance, and I go, I like, I kind of like this guy. This guy's got a sense of humour. This guy's very deep, you know, and it's very, very rewarding, you know. That is so, so yeah. <laughs> fucking cool. That is so cool. I, the only the closest yeah. thing I've ever come is this this podcast series, and I'll go back and listen to them, and like I'll hear someone say something, and I'll say to myself in that split yeah. second, "Please be smart in your reply. Please be smart in your reply." And then I'll say something either smart or stupid, and I'll be like, "God, why was I?" Or "Thank yeah. God I was I?" Or whatever. And uh, it, it takes first of all, you have to be comfortable being objective of your own work too. I mean, that's something that comes with maturity. Maturity is like actually being, liking the things that are good and being, you know, learning from the things that are bad and not beating yourself up too much and uh, all that. So that's really cool. Um, knowing yourself, I think is, is probably the most important thing all of us are st striving to do. And the thing is the, the, the me, the us kind of does evolve and change and it's a little bit squirrely to stay on top of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, sure. Something else you said, you said that, um, I'm still entitled to nothing, and so are you. My question for you is, have you had, have you supervised junior talent or mid-level mid talent? Who do, do you feel like entitlement is, a, is an issue that you've run up against or that they deserve something? I think, I think, you know, we talk a lot about, like, kind of the, you know, the millennial mindset. You know, with all honesty, I was a shit as well, and I, I wasn't, I kind of, like, wanted, wanted those things. I mean, I don't want to use myself as an example, but you know, I did go out and make things to get there. You know, I was more, you know, I, I, I showed rather than said in the end. Um, but I, I kind of think everyone feels entitled at some point, you know? Um, and I, and I, what I kind of do is I just say, I bless them. You know, what should I have done? Bless you, guys. It's just a shame. You kind of have to be that way you're entitled. <laughs> you, know? It, you know, it's actually the, 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 the thing it's like Millwall, right? Like, you know, Millwall football team, you're just telling me about this, their zero kind of draw, but they just have a Sheffield. And it's kind of like, 
you know, there's something very romantic if you can have a career that's up and down, as painful as it may be. Lose your job, have some failure, have some success, do something seminal, get forgotten, get, then get, have to get remembered again. You know, that's the kind of career you want. And that's, a, I believe, that's the kind of romantic career you want. And that's kind of what Millwall football team is like, because they fail all the time. Well, this but, is, uh, I was yeah. going to ask you, is this, is, this yeah. the, is this the Englishman in you? Is this think, is this having um, having been raised in having been you know grown up in England, where pain yeah, pain, yeah, yeah. pain is mandatory? It's a it's 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 part of it's part of life's sort of story. Yeah, it's Sucks. a meritocracy. Yeah, yeah, it, it, I think so. But it's also it's also yeah, pain is I guess I guess so, and it's you know pain. you 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 got to you know you know we're we're all up against it right now with you know what we're dealing with you know in, in terms of dealing with kind of this virus and we're really being tested and entitlement we're all entitled to freedom and we're all entitled to kind of go and have dinner with our friends and you know but we have to deal with it in the real time and and entitlement's abstract it's bullshit it doesn't, it doesn't do anything you just got to, so you got to kind of use your creative now to kind of get through this so yeah. entitlement's just like a i don't know if it's like a cry for help if anything you know oh, that's fascinating Maybe, you know you know it's like i'm entitled it's just like but help me because you know you've got to feel sorry for for a generation that grew up where you know people like mark zuckerberg is a billionaire and you know at 24 and you know the pressure from probably a lot of parents to kind of for their kids to kind of code and learn to succeed at that age is, is kind of probably weighs pretty heavy on them, you know? And even though that may not be, you know, prevalent with, with everybody, but I think it's there. I think there's a pressure there, you know? So, so maybe it is a cry for help. Maybe they're Dude, not, you know? Wow. That's fucking cool. All right. So Gavin, I have four, four Gavin and listeners. I have four more questions for you. All right. I could sit here. Dude, I could talk to you all day. Um, so what does it mean when you said hard work is hard? Uh, well, it is hard, yeah. I mean, it's like um, you've got to dig in lots of holes. You've got to, like, um, you know, stay hungry. You've got to, like, um, push so things. Do you, you know? do, you feel like, do you feel like there's such a thing as working harder or is it just working more? Like, what do you, what, I mean, is there a way to work harder or is it just a matter of putting time against it? Like, what do you, I'm, well, I'm curious about uh, that. Okay. All right. So let's put it like this. There are, there are these, in England, there's these Irish road builders, right? They're in their sixties and they're dealing with massive slabs of concrete and they've got to get them and cut them in half and they knock the, the chisel in the right place and it comes in, in you know, comes uh, apart in beautifully, Right. Now you put someone with no experience there, they're going to be tapping that chisel all over the place, it'll be crumbling away and they won't get anywhere. So to get to that point, to get to that point is going to take a lot of hard work. It's going to take a lot of research and development, failure, and all the, and probably a lot of kind of angry foreman, right? So hard work is, is you know, it's hard, but Gavin, it will pay off. It will pay off. Yeah, Gavin, have you seen Jiro Dreams of Sushi? Yes, exactly. The sun, the poor sun, right? Both of them. <laughs> yeah. Listeners, yeah. listeners, set, turn off the lights. Uh, go, go to a quiet room and watch Jiro Dreams of Sushi on, uh, I think it's on Netflix. All right. Um, so you said you still get scared. And I'm going to ask you this. Do you get scared? And you said new briefs, you still get this sort of sense of not quite fear, but I guess adrenaline pump fear. Do you suffer ever? Have you ever suffered from imposter syndrome where you think you're going to get found out? Um, you said confidence can be an enemy, creates complacency. Talk to me just a little bit about what, 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 what instills fear in you and your own confidence and how that has developed over time. I, I, I do have imposter syndrome. I, I, I do feel like I'm going to get caught out all the time. I, I do. I, 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 I've had moments. I mean, I, I was sitting outside, you know, before we hit COVID, and I was, and I just was a group of young creatives, and and um, and I just started laughing to myself, and I said, and then I said out loud, "I'm the creative, chief creative officer here." <laughs> Isn't that silly? <laughs> I was like, it was like a moment of clarity, a realization that I kind of arrived at that moment. It was kind of like that that Talking Heads song, you know, you know, let the days go by, and it was like, you know, you may find yourself living in a shotgun shack, right? So I kind of like. I think you just find yourself. So, um, and then, and then, so anyway, so, so what gives me confidence is all of 
the experiences that I've gone through, be it, you know, good or bad through the years, they almost become like, you know, um, they're almost like insurance policies, right? You know, so when you are working on something or somebody's working on something, you can pull from that as an insurance policy. You can say, okay, this is, these are watch outs. These are, these are things. If this does happen, this is what we can do. So that gives me, that puts me back on track again. But and then in terms of like every time I get a brief, yeah, I do get scared. I think it's very much like any actor who has to get, get on stage and perform. I'm sure they still feel those butterflies. And I think, you know, that's the kind of thing that kind of pushes you forward. So, yep, I'm, I'm still, I'm still kind of, I think, healthily nervous about. That's tremendous. You know, yeah. That's tremendous. All right. Final two questions. Um, okay. Oh my God, that's a big sigh. Is this terrible? Do you feel like you're at the no, doctor? No, I'm. So, no, I'm sorry. That was what was that exactly? I don't know. I maybe mean, it, that, that was like no, not like there's two more questions and I sighed. I don't know what that was. That was kind of like a sigh. I don't know. Not okay, of a relief. You're good. I'm you're fine. Good. I'm fine. Don't take. Don't read in between those. Those. That, All right. Uh, before before we get to these last two questions, I just want to say Ashley Milholland loves you. She no problem, she was right. right on point. She said that. Um, and I got to tell you. When you talk to students, you said that you aim to be, you know, open door and a, a teddy bear and all that. And people say that bullshit all the time. She said, hell yeah, it's completely 100% true that you're always there for her. And uh, this woman does not lie. She is a straight shooter and one of my favorite human beings. And for her to have that sort of testament for you, hats off, my friend. All right. Thank you. Thanks do you want to say something she's about a great, I, I do. I think she's one of the most <laughs> remarkable writers. She's an incredible writer. She's very um, gifted, articulate, and uh, you know she's gonna she's gonna do great. She's, she's gonna, she is doing great. Also, what I love about about Mill is she's of her time. She's so she's so keyed into everything. All right, so here's a question for you: What personal trait of yours? What is it about Gavin Lester? What personal trait has served you well or best so far in your career? What is it about you? I think I have a good sense of irony, you know. I think I kind of like don't take anything too seriously when it comes to it. So, English yeah. So that it's it's never that bad, you know. It's never that bad. And um, again, not to make excuses for why things are bad, you know, but it's a it's a coping mechanism, you know. So. Um, in, there's been some very tough times throughout my career and, you know, and there's been some ups and downs at Zambezi, you know, like any business, but I think it's, um, you know, retain, you know, the, the cool, be cool. Yeah, that's pretty and cool. Irony, irony helps that way as well. You know? No question about it. All right. Final question. I've asked pretty much everyone who's ever been on this podcast, knowing what you know now, if you could go back to Bath Academy as you're graduating with your BA in fine art, before you even start, before you even started at Euro, what would you whisper in young Gavin's ear? What would you tell yourself? Well, you know what? I'll tell you what I'll tell myself <laughs> because it was told to me when I was going into the EBH and it was like, go in guns blazing. Go in guns blazing. Oh, that's and, cool. and, and that's not, um, if you're taking the wrong way, but that's like, um, you know. No, what you, what you mean is don't, don't hold back. Don't be shy. Don't wait for permission. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't don't keep yeah. your best ideas hidden. Don't worry about embarrassing yourself. Don't worry about being bad. Don't worry about you know. That's what it means to me. Yeah, yeah. just going guns blazing and put on a show. And and I think also realize that you know you are working for yourself ultimately. You know, you know because you you know you know the, the I've got an amazing creative department here, and I hope they can grow here and stay with me. But I also know that they may not. You know, and it's it's. Um, it's, they've, they've got to look after their careers and move around if they have to, and that's yeah. good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a good friend of the school, Mike Byrne, who um, started Anomaly in New York, said the same yeah. thing. He said, you are a creative force. Um, not that you work for yourself, which I think is really profound, but he said, you're the creative force. Don't You, know, you don't need to rely on agencies or projects to, to, to define you. Um, mm -hmm. Gavin, thank you so much for this conversation. I really appreciate it. Doesn't it seem no, like we just got much. started? It's just awesome. I you know, know just, I know. Thank you. Any any final thoughts? I mean, I don't want to cut you off, but like, I, oh, I, I can keep going if you want for a bit. If you need to, I'm I'm all right. If you want, I don't know. Final thoughts. Um, well, you could talk about good as the enemy of great. You could talk about why you don't like emails. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Well, I, I mean, I didn't coin that that term. Good as the enemy of great. That's no. that's John Hegarty, and you know, uh, you know, like, wow, well, I've been fortunate enough to work with 
a legend, you know, and and um, he was my creative director at, at Bob Ogan Hegarty, and it was to be in the room with that, who who really kind of was, who when I talk about autonomy and I talk about the independent mentality and the mindset, he was the personification of that, right? That agency was a personification of that um, when I was there, you know. So um, it was brilliant to have someone who was really loose. I'm curious about this. Did you? become a better art director? Have you become a better art director throughout your career or a better thinker and a better craftsman? I mean, like how much did you learn your craft from creative directors? Um, art direction craft. Interesting. Um, yeah, I think, I think again, from being around some special people, we kind of learned, you know, they would, they would talk about less elements, you know, remove stuff, you know? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh then then you know just also just being exposed to great work around you when you're working at bbh when i was there 99 to 2005 it was like it was the agency you know so yeah. everything that came out of that place was was phenomenal you know phenomenal. so so that that you were automatically kind of like exposed to it and expected to do it so you had a fast track i i also think you know you know uh, to my credit, I would like to say I like being a creative. I work in it. I, I think craft is really important. I put a lot of emphasis on it. But our currency is ideas. Our currency is concepts, and that's where it needs to start. You know, for sure. Um, do you feel? Do, are you are you multicultural in your mind? Do you do you have a foot in an English upbringing and an American culture? Do you feel? Do you ever? Yeah. Flip back well, and forth. I, do you speak both languages? How do you? You know what I mean? Does this make sense? I think that's a great question, all right, because it, I think I am now, right? But I will tell you something. When I moved to New York in 2005, or two, or back and forth, I can't remember exactly when it was. But when I moved full-time, what happens is, is that England was, stuck, was going out of focus, right, for me, because it was distant. So the focal point was changing. And I was getting into focus in America. So there was a, probably a good probably two years of everything being out of focus, you know, from yeah. both sides. I wasn't sure what was going on in England and I was fo trying to focus in what's going on in America because the romance of what America was offering was starting to kind of wait, way up, kind of go away. And the reality of what America was starting to kind of appear, you know, the, the honeymoon period was over. So, so that was an amazing weird time. It was almost like being in, in limbo, you know, kind of like in, um, where is it like, in, I mean, um, you know, like uh, between the devil and the deep blue sea, I felt like purgatory. You know, so, purgatory, yeah. So there was a bit of that. Um, I was a nomad, but now I've kind of got you know my kids speak with an American accents, my dogs bark with American accents, and my wife says "nito" because she's from the Midwest, you know. And wait, and wait, I, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, Your dogs yeah. bark with an American accent. And I was just laughing. <laughs> even though one, I've got two pug, I've got two pugs which are Chinese and, and an Italian Spinoni, which is Italian, but they speak with an American accent. They both have an American accent. But but you know, so so I'm kind of like, you know, but you never really I think anyone anyone coming to this to any country is that there's always gonna be you're always gonna be somewhat of an outsider, even though I believe that America is America is completely welcoming to any outsider. And I hope it continues for the next um president um, yeah um so uh, uh but but yeah but i've learned the language i also another thing just to talk about is like so i grew up in england right obviously and when i got into advertising we were doing regional advertising right because i was a young 25 year old whatever in doing just abbey national ads for back newspaper and then up from regional you get a bite of na nationwide which is the whole of the uk then nationwide i learned how to do pan-european which you then had to change your kind of your creative focus a little bit because very you visual to use, focus. Exactly. Narrative visual narrative, which is perfect for VBH, because that was a very visual narrative based agency. And then I came to America and then it all started all over again. Because I completely you know, you completely kind of dis disband your 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 pan European and your 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 home. And then I had to start in again because like America isn't doesn't speak the same language in other parts. So I had to yeah. learn all that again, you know, kind of like some regional work and then nationwide work and then back into the global arena, you know, starting up with Mexico, South America and 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 Canada, and then back into the global where I ended up kind of doing work with Sony Global. So it was very interesting. So I feel like I've been turned inside out, you know. 
yeah, that's really cool. It's like, it's, it's like, and it keeps, yeah, yeah. It keeps you sharp too. I mean, you can't be complacent when you have to do that. That's really cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks again. And okay. So you're not a big, you're not a big fan of email. So listeners, you're going to have to figure out a way if you want to talk to Gavin to do it in a way that's creative and not rote and familiar. And, 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 and as he said, the same familiar cadence that every email has, figure that out on your own. Uh, please reach out to me at any time. My email is danspodcast at mac.com. I really screwed up on the last episode when I, get, I forgot to give out my Instagram handle and I got people following my personal Instagram, which is not something you want to see. The Instagram handle is DGMS Podcast on Instagram. DGMS Podcast. Um, also, if, you, if you're so inclined, leave a review at the iTunes store and you can listen to this on Spotify if you didn't know that. Podcast is on Spotify so you can listen to that on your device without even downloading it into this podcast app. Gavin, dude, thank you so much. Such, such a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, good. All right. Listeners. Well, it's a very big day today, big day today, so let's... Uh, yeah, I, we didn't mention that today's election day. I, I scheduled my full slate so I could stay away from the news. Listeners, we'll see uh, you again in two weeks. Until then, see you, see you bye. Bye-bye.